So are we on the brink of a revolution in healthcare? The wearables revolution. It feels like we've talked about it for the last decade, but in the last few years in particular, with the advancements in technology, increase in utility, and broader adoption of wearables, are we at a tipping point where they become mainstream across healthcare systems globally? Well, with me today is Jao Bokas, CEO of Digital Salutem in the UK. He's a wearables expert, digital health influencer, and he's on a mission to fix healthcare. In this episode, we talk about the rise of wearables, the practical application, the barriers to wider adoption, and what the future might look like. Collaboration starts with the conversation, Team Health Tech. Let's make it happen. This is Talking Health Tech with me, Peter Birch, featuring content and community about technology in healthcare. Joao Bocas, how are you? I'm doing well, Pete. Nice to see you and uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me. Great to have you on the show, mate. Look, I, I've been excited to have this conversation for a while. I've seen your work through the different social media platforms and, you know, online and wanted to connect with you directly to learn a bit more. But for those that don't know you, Joao, tell me a bit more about you and what you do firstly. Sure. So my name is Joao Bocas, also known as the wearables expert, uh, Portuguese national based in UK for the last um, uh, 21 years. And I've been in healthcare personally for over 25 years, but the last seven years, I've been heavily involved in digital health, health tech, and wearables. Working globally, um, I'm also the CEO of uh, Digital Salutem, which is a global leader in wearables and digital health. is a consultancy uh, business. So delighted to be here. Great. Talk to me a bit more about wearables then and the type of work that you're, you're doing with those. Sure. So I've seen wearables really uh, progressing and coming into the healthcare space for quite some time. And I think um, we're reaching a point now that I think we're tipping the, I mean, it's tipping over to the adoption phase because we've been thinking and talking a lot around using wearables and maximizing them, leveraging them. But I believe wearables will be a crucial vehicle for the healthcare delivery of the future where uh, patients and users can proactively manage their health, also manage long-term conditions. But I've been doing research around wearables, also using them for quite some time. I'm also a fitness and um, a sports uh, lover, so I've been into wearables and performance for quite some time. So I've done quite a number of things, small projects, large-scale projects, and a lot of research about the wearables um, marketplace. Interesting you bring up the fitness and performance side because typically, and especially maybe even just 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, wearables probably was more so prominent in that particular space I found, you know, perhaps athletes or people wanting to track their fitness and, you know, everyone's talking about getting their 10,000 steps and all of that. And probably even up to five years ago, clinicians might say, well, I'm not interested in the information that's captured on a patient's wearables. So, you know, that's nice for the patient and a, and a nice little kind of gimmick. And if that's helpful from a sports perspective, that's great. But it sounds like there's much more relevance for wearables in the healthcare side of things. Are you finding that? Yeah. What is um, uh, interesting is, uh, for example, our, uh, we have to divide wearables into two main categories, if you like, the non-medical device, fitness, health, health trackers, and the true medical grade devices. But what I've been finding is that um, sometimes it's very difficult for clinicians to see the value and also to target a specific condition with a specific type of data set. What I've been finding is that the value is usually through a correlation to a different data set. So for example, if you have um, a heart condition, you might, you might get the interest in the heart rate variability and even your resting heart rate. So it's correlation through data. But I see now that is a lot of value. Even the pharma companies now are doing virtual clinical trials using wearables and tra tracking patients uh, remotely. So wearables certainly bring a lot of value and potential, if you like. 
And no doubt recently, or over the last few years through COVID with the um, significant rise in telehealth services and virtual care, wearables play a really important part in in that as well. Te- you know, telehealth and virtual care is not just doing a consultation over some screens, having the uh, input through and, and the ability to monitor a patient through a wearable would be really important. Yeah, and also, I mean, it gives that um, remote capability. And now, as you've seen um, with the pandemic, there are two things that really jumped out. One, uh, the digital world and also the telehealth, telemedicine is really rise up through the roof, but also that remote capability for a few months. We have, for example, um, we had lockdowns around the world and you couldn't go to an hospital, you couldn't visit the doctor. So all these things, I think, just broadened the awareness and also pushed us uh, to start doing things differently. And wearables certainly come into that um, category of uh, doing things differently, you know. What are you seeing as is being tracked through wearables? Because, you know, the, the, the easy ones I can think of are steps and I guess vitals like heart rate, but there, there's a lot more that can be be tracked through through wearables these days, right? What are you seeing? Yeah, yeah uh, um, there are some very interesting studies. For example, I'm a, uh, I try to stay independent. I'm a global advocate of wearables, but there were some studies, for example, a particular uh, a piece of uh, wearable, the smart ring from Aura Ring, that mm. even detect um, body temperature fluctuations. They even predict that um, you're more prone to get COVID. The, uh, I mean, they they could diagnose COVID early by diagnosing um, uh, body temperature changes. So there are many things that wearables now uh, can provide, such as that. Uh, certainly the sleep data. I think we're moving away from that traditional 10,000 10, steps counter because it, it's, a, it's a bit obsolete. For example, mm. if, you are a, if you are an athlete, 10,000 steps, it might, I mean, it might not mean anything to you. For a person that is probably with um, a high risk of um, um, long-term conditions through obesity or something like that, it's actually very relevant to do the 10,000 steps in order to change the behavior. But one of the things that I always talk about wearables is the wearables on their own, they're not the miracle. The miracle is the human being driving the change of behavior. And and what is what needs to happen is the change of behavior combined with the data, combined with the wearable. But the wearables also now provide a lot of um, behavioral um, uh, input, such as um, alerts to move your legs to your uh, sleep uh, time is is coming soon, start to wind down, even meditation tricks. So wearables are starting mm-hmm. to give this kind of bounce back. If you use them accordingly, you can actually get quite a lot out of them. Absolutely. And, and you think about then, you know, I guess for want of a better term, stacking these technologies on top of each other when you think about wearables providing the ability to monitor or give some visibility on how things are going for a patient, but then looking at some of the other capabilities around digital therapeutics. So apps that provide feedback through other ways that might connect to some of these tools and the, you know, you know, intelligent use of AI and and other things to perhaps pull data from, from other perspectives to really give this, you know, much more comprehensive view of a patient. So wearable certainly plays a really important part in that whole kind of digital health ecosystem. Are you seeing any other types of technologies that play really nicely with wearables or perhaps extend from, you know, what wearables can do to to really help make a meaningful impact for patients? Yeah, sure. Well, I would say, uh, Pete, to right away is artificial intelligence. And it's a big uh, buzzword, sometimes misused and just uh, used with no meaning because it's a buzzword everybody likes to use. But I actually wrote a book chapter uh, on wearables. The combination, my vision is that the combination of um, artificial intelligence and wearables will be the true game changer in healthcare. And you might ask why. And for the audience, a few years ago, we were not ready. I'm sure you remember when the Google Glasses came out in 2014. It was a major failure because the market was not ready. They were extremely expensive. 
the clinicians were certainly not the people to buy Google Glasses for $1,500 or $2,000. So it, it, the market was not ready. But now what I'm seeing is the market is ready for adoption, certainly for wearables. Technology has um, progressed, even though it was already ready probably 10 or 15 years ago. But now the combination of both is really happening. And um, uh, we have a lot of data now. We have the artificial intelligence, the capabilities in technology that is ready, and we have the wearables. And I believe that will be a truly uh, game-changer combination. I agree. I think about some patient interactions, either from my own perspective as a, as a patient or just what I hear generally. I still think there's quite a majority where a majority of the time where a patient might be utilizing, say, a wearable. They might be someone who's a bit more active as a patient and, you know, utilizing wearables or, or digital health generally to have a bit more of a view of what's going on in their health. But then they come to, say, a, a, a GP consult or a clinician, a, a consultation with their doctor, and there's still not this level of trust that a clinician can provide in perhaps the the output or the measures that have come from a wearable and they'll want to do a lot of retests just to be able to have that clarification. So where do you see it, particularly because you've got that global view as well, how close are we to having wearables that are, you know, that that can be trusted by clinicians and used as, you know, that that first point of reference for when a patient has something going on, then there can be that that trust in the results that the wearables have provided and, and don't require a bunch of retests going on. Well, Pete, that is a very, um, a very good point. What I've seen is there are always concerns about the user-related concerns around um, privacy, security, but also what you mentioned is more around data accuracy. And it's certainly mm -hmm. very relevant. And I'll give you an example. I use many wearables, and sometimes if you have a tracker, you get up in the morning and he says 200 steps, but you haven't got out of bed yet because, I mean, because they use the accelerometer technology, isn't it? The movement technology. So they're not very, very accurate. It is a very good point. And also they, they, they show a discrepancy between 10 or 20% from wearable to wearable. Mm. So it, it's very difficult to kind of saying, okay, actually I can trust even the heart rate, for example, a great indicator, but it's very difficult um, to totally rely on it. On the other hand, in the healthcare uh, perspective, um, a discrepancy of 10 or 20% in medical terms, and I'm not a clinician, I'm an entrepreneur, but in medical terms um, is a very um, wide gap for error. You can't mm. really rely or... But what I'm seeing is that clinicians, one, don't have the right expertise, but also don't really have the time to deal with that, to deal with analyzing data on a consultation, to go through data, to go through your pattern of behavior, to go and analyze and retest, as you mentioned, what has been done. So I think we have a bit of, it's not just around the wearables, but we have a bit of like a process issue in here. Which way should it be done? Uh, should we bring the data, but then the data might not be totally accurate and reliable? Or is that the clinician test on a spot? Or what can it be done in a different way that actually remove that barrier of trust, but also the uh, need to retest? And also the majority of systems in, in, in our days are not actually using wearables and clinicians are very new to it and reluctant to use them because they're not embedded in a full healthcare continuum of care process yet. Mm -hmm. They will be, but they're not there yet. So it's a bit this like dynamic that we're talking about them, but we're not really relying on them yet. Yes. One of those barriers that I find can slow down progression or, or adoption of technology in healthcare. One of those that, that can be funding. So who pays for it? And I know particularly in Australia, there's not a great deal of funding that kind of links to the use of wearables. So it usually falls either 
I guess, to the patient to, to utilize something and to pay for if that's something they're willing to do. And in a healthcare system like Australia, which is different to the NHS, but there are some similarities, you know, not, not, a, not a lot of Australians like to pay for too much healthcare, let's put it that way. So um, how do you find it with a bit more of that global view when it comes to funding mechanism, mechanisms and how people pay for wearables? Are you seeing some traction or positive signs that um, those, those that are providing reimbursement for these types of things are, are recognizing wearables as, a, as something that's worth rebating for? Yeah, well, Pete, we are not there yet. I think we are heading in that direction. And my ideal vision would be turning this um, dynamic in healthcare and give the power to the patient. And what I want to say is that if you track your health and if you show that you actually are looking after yourself and if you show positive signs, you can actually negotiate or with the health system or with the insurance company or with the private provider for a discount or for healthcare, uh, a benefit. Yeah. The US market is very different than all of the other markets because it's fully privatized, but also they're lacking behind everywhere, everywhere else in the world, which is uh, very, very strange. But the wearables are not embedded in health systems. Even in here in UK, I, I'm based in UK, working globally, as you know. Even in here in UK, uh, the NHS is not quite, and we've been talking about this for six, seven, eight years, is not fully embedded the wearables. They're doing some research, they're doing small projects. And I think one opportunity that we are missing is that um, implementing preventative measures, implementing uh, um, um, actually encourage people to use a wearable on a discounted rate or free of charge or, you know. Mm. So these things are starting to appear, but they're not quite there. But one example that I give you is of, uh, an insurer, a private insurer in the UK, also global, is a, a, gr a group called Vitality. They, uh, through a private um, insurance uh, policy, if you use a wearable, you're starting to get benefits. You get the wearable at discounted rate with your uh, uh, policy. But mm. then if you show uh, behavioral, health behavioral changes, going to the gym, you allocated a number of points, uh, being active, uh, bringing the data in, we're starting to see the benefit for the user. You get points, you get discounts, you get benefits. And I think... I'm actually very surprised. This has been in place for quite some time, not with just with barrels, but the system of this private insurer giving benefits in wellness terms uh, for users. I'm actually quite surprised. No one really um, identified that uh, uh, system and implemented on a global scale. And I was, I, I'm surprised that other insurers and other uh, providers, they're not following this system because we know it works. We know that investing in health has long-term benefits and long-term savings and everything else. But because it's always this issue that you mentioned, who's paying for it? The upfront investment. Um, it, it's always this issue that is a big barrier, as you mentioned, who is paying for it? So we're not seeing the developments in health systems because we act in an old way that we always we always did so we follow we always follow the same way okay who's gonna pay for it no one so we stay the same yeah exactly so do you think then for us to see some meaningful change in this space you know mm, policy makers decision makers need to see those examples and the research come through and perhaps those early adopters and and innovators who take a bit of a, a leap and 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 trailblaze and demonstrate the effectiveness so that then it has potential to then roll out to the broader population and help more people is that how we how we try and move the needle here or what else what else can you think of yeah things are starting to move um a small project showing uh, benefits and impact um but yeah i think um we need certainly to do something different we need to invest in innovation that actually delivers results, not just 
I go to a lot of events, Pete, and, and sometimes we're talking about these things for, uh, it's a bit frustrating. I don't have the answer for everything, but things that we're talking about seven years ago, mm. it sounds like, it, it feels like it's a bit of a loop. Seven years ago, we're talking about this. Oh, we, who owns the data? Oh, yeah, the, uh, the electronic medical records are not accessible there. I mean, sometimes it's a bit, oh, come on, we're talking about this 10 years ago. You know, it's mm. a bit, so I, I don't want to criticize the NHS is great. I love living in UK, but sometimes it's a bit like something is lacking. A leadership, no. a courageous acting they say okay this is what we're gonna do i always refer to the nordic countries because they are they are they very innovative uh sometimes it's easier to innovate there because the populations are smaller uh, six million people or 10 million i love finland um uh, denmark you see estonia the digital capital of the world as they say because they everything is digital they are all digital services health tech is great they got all the electronic and medical records integrated everything works well but one thing that they've done extremely extremely well is they let uh access for example for pilots if Finland is great to health systems to hospitals they let the startups dip their toe into the system the other thing is they invest in innovation quite a lot. They have incentives. They let a startups access people, money, and things. And the other thing that they've done incredibly well is they plan ahead. They say, for this is an example, why are we still struggling with electronic or medical records? If you're in London, you don't have access to Manchester. If you have an accident in Liverpool, you don't know what's, what's your medical record in the Southeast. So, for example... They had a plan. They're saying by 2000, this is an example, 18, we want everything in one place. And they follow through. It didn't take them three or four months. It took them three or four years. But I think that is an example for all others to follow suit. Mm. Let's follow that. It works. You know, so I, I, I love and I've done a lot of consultancy with the health tech startups and scale ups from the Nordics and business development and lots of different things. And I had a bit of on the ground um, experience and I work with different companies, very successful. Uh, the, the, the Finnish, by the way, the Nordics are very, um, very successful with wearables because they launch very successful uh, wearable brands. They have a really true ex history. That Polar, Sunto, uh, yeah, they oh, have very, yeah, they, they have a really pedigree with wearables. And that's a reflection. It's um, uh, um, uh, they have that history. They have that you know. It's not just because they are okay. They're great. No, no. They have that uh, um, um, history, traditional uh, uh, health tech and innovation uh, framework. Yeah, which they can they can draw draw inspiration from. Yeah. So then. Lastly, thinking about then, you know, let's say we overcome some of those, draw inspiration from those Nordic countries, those places that might be nailing it or, or invest in that longer term strategy. What are you hoping that the, that future really looks like where as a system where we're embracing wearables? What, you know, what does it look like when we nail this thing, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, utilizing technology to help make a meaningful impact in a lot of people's lives? Yeah, my, my big vision, Pete, is that the wearables can change the world and certainly the healthcare world. In the ideal world, I would like to see um, more investment in education. I talk to a lot of clinicians and different stakeholders. And one thing that is always, always um, apparent is, is no investment in health education. Not mm. just the technology or using a wearable, but education is in general terms. If you have a condition, for example, an health condition, you need to know about your condition. That's um, normal. You learn about your diabetes, your heart condition, your COPD. But I remember in here in UK, a good 15, 20 years ago, where they had these campaigns about, for example, uh, five a day of portions of fruit, uh, smoking mm. cessation. They had these campaigns on the national television. They had posters. They had all these things going to help people, to educate the population. Now, there is nothing going on. 
Mm. I'm not. We we could even revolutionize the system and say, okay, encourage people to buy a wearable, or encourage people to educate mm. them how to use them, or educate people about mm. or using the diet, or whatever that is that needs to be done. But it's a big gap between the technology, uh, not just the adoption, but that education piece. And I've done a 159 pages health engagement report. And we came up with some user-related barriers and also some device-related barriers. And one of the big barriers around the device usage was the lack of support, the direction and guidance, which is related to education. Sometimes it's very basic. Okay, charge your wearable, get a meaningful connection with one data set because you need intrinsic motivation to use your wearable. No, no usage, no data, no data, no value. So sometimes it's very basic. We charge our phones. We need to tell people, uh, charge your wearable. Don't let it run out of battery. Make sure you engage. Make sure you, you know. Mm. So all these things. So I think is a lot is a lot to be done. Lots to be done, but it's an exciting future to consider. So, Jabokas, I appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with us on the show. We'll put the details in the show notes of this episode. People can check out all your platforms and the things that you do if they're keen to learn more and connect. Uh, Appreciate you making the time and uh, hopefully do the same again at some point soon. Thank you so much. Peter, thank you so much for having me. For more content and community about technology and healthcare, visit talkinghealthtech.com. 